author is funded by the Pacific Northwest Writers Association, supporting writers from pen to publication since 1955. To learn more about the PNWA and their yearly conference, please go to pnwa.org. Hi, this is Bill Knauer of Author Magazine, and I'm here at the University Bookstore in Seattle, Washington with Ingrid Ricks, author of Hippie Boy. Ingrid, welcome to Author. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Ingrid, you know, this story is very interesting. It's a very compelling story. Thank you. How you've written it. But I know how it works, that it's your life. Did you know it was a story worth telling, or did you have to kind of come to the realization that, you know, that period of my life, that there's a story there. It seems obvious to me having read it. I, I always thought it was a good story and it's always a story that I wanted to tell. In fact, I would tell it for years to anyone who would listen. Oh, <laughs> so, oh you would. Yeah, and even those who didn't want to listen. So it felt like your story. Yeah, it, it was the story I had to tell. And it really is the story of, it seems to me the story of, of you forming. Of what yeah, formed you. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely the story about how I found my voice and power. Because you were in an environment where your voice was not being heard. E exactly. I mean, when I, when I talk about Hippie Boy, I mean, it really is the story of a teenage girl, m myself, who wanted desperately to escape the extreme poverty and religion, and most of all, her oppressive Mormon stepfather at home. And so to escape, Starting the summers when she was 13, she would go out on the road, I would go out on the road, and live with my dad as a tool-selling vagabond. And he became my lifeline and my escape. Um, but then the summer that I was 16, um, we ran into some trouble with the law. And, and at that point, I really understood that I had to take charge of my life and that no one was going to save me but, but myself. So yeah, absolutely about finding my voice and figuring how to get through a really tough time and come out on the other side. Isn't it interesting in our lives how sometimes our villains and our oppressive environments are so, they, we so need them to, to find out who we are almost. I mean, not that right. you would wish necessarily those things on someone, and yet how could you even picture yourself without Earl and that terrible little house that you describe so vividly in, in, in your memoir? Who would you be without those things? Right, I mean, they say, right? What doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? And for sure, I look back at that and I would never want to go back and, and live it. But since I have lived it, um, I'm glad for the person that it made me because I think it made me very resilient and it made me a fighter. Your sister Connie was a fighter from the get-go, it sounds right. like. Do you, do you feel that she helped teach you some aspect of that? You know, it was interesting. I don't think I even fully appreciated just how strong she was until I sat down to write the book because she was always so quiet. I mean, she was the quiet, strong one while I tended to kind of scream more and, and, and fight more verbally, but wasn't as strong as she was. And, and really, all the way through to the end, I, I really recognized that, yeah, she carved the way, for sure. This is so interesting about the memoir, and I, and I, and I, I write memoir, and I know a lot of people now who do, and there's always what you, so you've told it, you lived it, right? and then you told it, and then you wrote it. Right. And didn't you learn something in writing it that you hadn't understood in living it and telling it? Like, for instance, about Connie. Yeah, I, I mean, I learned that. I also learned really, I mean, as I just said, Hippie Boy's about finding my voice and power, but I don't think that I fully found it until I wrote it. And then I started sharing it with people and recognizing kind of the validation that comes from writing your story and being heard, you know. So that was the other thing that I learned. This is a theme that comes up again and again and again. Don't you have to hear yourself? Don't you, I mean, other people have to hear you, but you have to be willing to. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, when I, when I first, when I first started getting the story out, I mean, before it was ever published in essays, and then, and then podcasts. I think the, where that light went off in my head, I was invited to do um, an hour-long uh, interview with this podcast called Mormon Expression. And they just asked me to tell my story. And I did, and it was so empowering. And then um, all these women, I thought I was alone, that I was the only one who had experienced this. 
And I probably had 35 women who went on and said that happened to me too. It's you know the themes of abuse of um, religious power and uh, you know using it as a weapon. So you know you put it's a tricky position you have to be in in that, and maybe you can talk about this. Obviously, you don't want to vilif villainize all of Mormonism, right. but the way the structure is, it's very easy to it seems to me to use the structure that's been been built as an abusive tool yeah, if you're I mean, so inclined. Yeah. It, it was a struggle for me there, and that was probably the biggest challenge with writing the story. One, I love my parents. I didn't want to hurt them. Right. And two, I didn't want people to think that I was attacking the Mormon religion. I mean, my, my story about um, abuse of power could happen in any religion. It just so happened that it happened in the Mormon religion. But um, it bothers me when people say, that couldn't have happened, or or this doesn't happen. I mean, and because it does, absolute power corrupts anywhere. And the more that you can talk about it and build awareness, um, the more maybe something can be done about it. You know, absolutely. It seems to me anytime one person says has the belief that all voices aren't equal, right? You're in trouble. Absolutely. And it it was it was a really oppressive environment, and and that's why I loved going out on the road with my dad. I mean, my friends would say, "How can you stand it?" I, we were in this sweaty pickup truck <laughs> twelve hours a day, yep. and I would spend my summer selling tools and no eating breakfast till we'd sold a hundred bucks worth of tools, no quitting till we'd sold five hundred bucks worth of tools. If we made enough, we slept in a motel six. If we didn't. We slept in the back of the truck, and it just didn't matter because I felt free, and I felt like a partner, and I felt like I was being heard, like my dad thought I was equal. So, absolutely. Your portrayal of your dad's very interesting, uh, and it's really a great portrayal because his flaws are clear right. from the get-go, and right. your love of him is clear. Right. But his 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 strength as a father, it seems to me, was his treating you as his as his equal. Absolutely. As problematic as that could be sometimes, yeah. it was you was so necessary for you. Yeah, it made all the difference. I mean, he was he was my lifeline and, and my escape. And because he treated me that way, I would have done anything for him. I did do anything for him, you know? And just because he made me feel like I counted, yeah. that my voice mattered. It's so funny that I'm talking to you now because I, I teach memoir, and one of the things I teach, and I don't know if I can teach it now, it's quite the way I have before having read your book, is that there aren't, in memoir, there aren't villains, typically. But, <laughs> and then I read Hippie Boy, right. describe the, tell us about Earl, and really he's as close as you will come to a villain in a memoir as, <laughs> as, as I've ever read. Earl, man, I, I mean, he was this homeless Vietnam vet who, I think he saw my mom and he saw an opportunity for sure. My my mom, really a devout Mormon and yeah. co converted to the religion. And when my parents divorced and she no longer had a temple marriage, because of her belief system, she felt like she really quickly needed to get into another marriage with a priesthood holding man. The thing is, when he showed up at the door, I mean this greasy haired, like pale guy with uh, like the meanest, kind of icy eyes. I, I mean, all of us kids could see him for what he was. He didn't hold the right level of priesthood at the time to even get married in the temple. But within three weeks, they had made a decision to get married, three weeks of dating. And, and he went to the church and got that level of priesthood that he needed, and then immediately began wielding it as a weapon. Yeah. I mean, immediately. It was crazy. You know, most of the writers I, I interview, the large percentage know by age nine that's what they want to do. Not all, Wally Lamb didn't know until he was 30 or whatever. It's all, it varies. But when you were nine, you had a lot of things on your plate and writing it didn't seem to me was one of them. So yeah. when did you wake up that this was how you wanted to communicate with the world? You know, when I was in college, um, I just remember, and at the time it was more I wanted to be a print journalist, you know, and, oh. and I, I started my Why career. Why journalism? What? I love to tell stories, and it was the same. I mean, I didn't know at that time that I wanted to write my story. I mean, I think that came a few years later, but I knew that I wanted to write stories and write um, people's stories. And, and I had that opportunity. I had the opportunity to go twice to Africa to write about AIDS orphans or children orphaned by war. I, I've, you know, I've, I've written a lot about 
kind of people who you know, are the underdogs or have really had a tough time in life, you know, and I was drawn to them, and I, I think because of my background. And so when did the switch come that you allowed yourself to start telling some of your stories? You know, it's, it's funny. I mean, I always wanted to, but when I, my husband went to law school when I was, I guess I was around 30, and I had to take a job at an advertising agency to make, make ends meet. And I was so miserable, and my dad at the time, this funny thing, my dad at the time had this telecom company going, and he was making a lot of money, and he hired me to write his rags to riches story. So I started writing it, but I kept inserting my story. You know, right, because you're kept, a part of his rags I to kept, riches. Exactly. I, but the funny thing is that by the end of it, it was rags to riches to rags. Right. But and you didn't um, want the story anymore. <laughs> well, no, I I still wrote that story. Oh, you did. I still wrote okay. that story. The I, I in fact went to, but it's full of my hippie boy insertions, right? And I, I went to Pacific Northwest Writers Association. I, I met this agent who I convinced to take this manuscript and I will never forget what she said. She said, I don't know what this is. It's, she said it's part one man's business account, part memoir, and part an anti-self-help how not to succeed book. And I just know I can't sell this. <laughs> so, so then I just went to my dad and it's like, you know, Let's put this aside. I want to tell this story. And that's really when I started um, sitting down saying, okay, I'm going to write this story. When you tell a memoir, you have to retell your life. You have to reframe it for yourself in a way because right. you can't be powerless because no one wants to read a memoir about a victim. <laughs> and you could yeah, have been a victim. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And like I said, I mean, it, it, so my, my, without giving it all, all away, really, I found my voice in that courtroom. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Um, for a lot of years, I would sit down and I would try to write this story, and I couldn't couldn't fully do it because because I didn't want to hurt my parents or offend people who. Right. But also because it was so emotional for me that I would cry whenever I sat down to write it. And then ten years ago, almost to the date now, I walked into an eye doctor's office first time in my life, expecting to walk out with a cute pair of red cat eye frames, and instead was told I suffered from an incurable degenerative eye disease and that I was already legally blind and, and that I was gonna be blind. And, and I started on this quest to try to understand how I could possibly save my eyesight. And so in 2008, I found myself sitting in a doctor's office down in San Francisco with a guy who focuses on whole body health. And within minutes, he asked me to tell him about my childhood. And I started sobbing. And he made me understand two very important things. One, he said, do you recognize that you're carrying this huge negative energy charge inside of you for something that happened so long ago and you're giving him, that Earl, still your power, you know? That's right. And he said, and do you, if you think that this isn't impacting your physical health, you're just crazy. And the idea that carrying that inside me could be causing me to go blind is ultimately the thing that made me say, man, I gotta tell this story. All right, well, Ingrid, I've got one more question for okay. you. And what I'd like you to do is finish the sentence for me. Okay. If writing has taught me anything, it has taught me what? Wow. So, so for me, because I tell um, personal stories, it's really taught me the power of personal storytelling. And, and what's happened with me is that my story, Hippie Boy, um, has been being used as a guide to help at-risk teens find their voice and power by writing their stories. And, and it's just that idea, that understanding that, that when you give yourself permission to tell your story and you tell it really honestly and as authentic as you can, it connects with other people. I mean, it's not only healing for you and validating, but it connects with other people, makes them know that they're not alone, and it just keeps going and going. It's like a domino effect. So it's the power of personal storytelling.